Hi, I'm Tim Landward from Tight Lines Fly Fishing Company. And today we're going to talk about mayflies and the different flies that we're going to use to actually imitate those. But before we dive into you know, picking and choosing the flies that are going to represent the mayfly, we have to first talk a little bit about the mayfly itself and to give you an understanding of that particular insect in the stream and how it actually uh, works as a trout food organism. So if we take a peek, I have a diagram here that actually shows the life cycle of the mayfly. Now the mayfly is an insect that lives in the bottom of the river and it starts its life off as what we call a nymph, which is you know a small little insect that'll cruise around the rocks and things and live its life on the bottom of the river for essentially a year. After a year passes, when water temperatures are correct, when air temperatures are correct, you know, when light and everything is right, that particular species of mayfly is going to either swim to the surface of the water and start to emerge or crawl to streamside vegetation or to the rocks along the shoreline and it's going to actually emerge. And you can see in the next picture here, it's actually crawling out of that nymphal shuck. And what will happen is it'll crawl out of the nymphal shuck and at that point it'll become what we call a newly hatched dun. And what will happen is that adult will sit on the surface of the water and it's going to start pumping blood into its wings and it's going to try to dry its wings out. Now at this point it's extremely susceptible to being eaten by a trout and this would be what we would call the dry fly stage of a mayfly. So it'll be floating down along the stream trying to dry its wings out and if in fact it successfully dries its wings before being eaten it'll fly off the river to streamside vegetation, the trees and foliage around the river and it'll spend about 24 hours there where it'll do its final molting where it'll actually shed its skin a couple more times and become a, a sexually mature insect. And that sexually mature insect is what we call a spinner. And that is right here. And what it'll do is that spinner will fly above the riffles and above the water and it'll actually go into a, a, a mating swarm. They'll lay their eggs on the water and then they will die and lay spent, just as you see here. So they'll lay spent on the river and again, very, very susceptible to the trout. Now it's a very, very distinct characteristic of a mayfly. If you go to the river and you're seeing bugs on the water, well, what, how do I tell it's a mayfly? The most distinct characteristic of the mayfly is this beautiful little upright wing. It looks like a little sailboat as it's coming down on the river. All mayflies have that little upright wing. But as you can see in the pictures here, this would be a mayfly nymph, this would be the newly hatched dun, and this would be the spinner. How can you tell the difference between the newly hatched dun and the spinner? Well, you can see that the newly hatched dun's wing is standing upright. The spinner is laying dead, spent on the water with its wings outstretched. But another very, very good characteristic to identify that is if you look at the color of the wings, the dun, it's not perfectly clear. It's kind of opaque, where the spinner itself has a pretty much completely clear wing on it. So it's a good way to be able to tell. Now there are literally thousands of types of mayflies that live in our water and uh, you don't have to be, as a beginner, you don't have to get extremely, extremely specific with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you out, figure out a couple different flies that we're going to use for each of those stages in what we feel as a shop to be the best all around patterns. So let's take a little look at some of the insects, or some of the, the uh, flies rather, to imitate these insects. We're going to first start out with that nymph because that nymph is in the water for 365 days out of the year, well, pretty close to that at least. The first fly that we tell all beginners to have in their box to imitate the nymph is a fly that we call the gold-ribbed hare's ear nymph. And uh, I'd have to say as far as beginners go and as far as nymphs go, this little rascal is responsible for more fish caught than any other of the nymphs that I'm going to show you. Most beginners end up doing most of their damage on a fly like this. Um, now the second variation to that is they do make that fly with what is called a bead head. And these have a little bead on the front of them. And you know, in past years people thought, well, what is that bead doing? It's adding a little bit of sparkle, you know, why is the fish keying in on that? And I really believe it's not necessarily just a sparkle, but I think the addition of extra weight helping get that fly down to where the trout are actually feeding. So th they make both variations, a regular gold-ribbed hair's ear and a beaded variation. I would recommend having both of them. Now when you're trying to imitate the insect, there's three basic things that you have to keep in mind. 
size, silhouette, and color. Now I'm going to show you a bunch of different flies, but this is so, so important because all you have to do is take a look at the insects that are hatching and say, well, this is the right size. This is very, very close to the right size. This is the right silhouette. This is what the trout is actually seeing. And then thirdly, the color. And most beginners actually look at the color of the fly and say, well, this is the color of the fly. This is what I'm going to use. But that's really the third most important. What I'm getting at here is you need to have these flies in different sizes. You have to have them in different sizes, you have to have them in different silhouettes, and you have to have them in different colors. And I'll show you an example of that. But the gold-ribbed hair here for a nymph is, a, is, is definitely an essential fly for you to have. The next fly that's essential for you to have is the, B, or the prince nymph. I'll grab one of these out. The prince nymph. Again, just a good general impressionistic nymph, could represent a lot of different mayflies, could represent some of our smaller stoneflies, but again, have the prince nymphs in assorted sizes as well. And then finally, for the nymphs, those were all medium-sized nymphs. Now there are a lot of different species of mayflies that are extremely small. So to give you just an idea, you see how tiny this is? This is a pheasant tail nymph. And to represent all of our smaller mayflies, this one is extremely important. Those three nymphs are all that you need to really get started in this sport. Now, we've covered the nymph. Now let's take a look at the newly hatched dun. The emerging dun, from a beginner standpoint, we're going to eliminate that. But the newly hatched dun is the next thing that's very important. And the fly that we're going to use to represent that newly hatched dun is a dry fly, this floats where the nymph sank, is a fly called the Adams. And the Adams looks like a mayfly because it has the little upright wings just like the, uh, the natural would. So you want to make sure it has that. And you want to get these in assorted sizes as well. So we have the Adams. Now the final stage of the fly, the spinner, we want to represent the insect with its wings laying outright laying dead on the water, motionless. And to represent that fly, or that stage, I should say, we're going to use a fly that's called an Adam's parachute. And basically all that it is, is the hackle, or the feather, is wrapped around this little post, and it just looks like the wings are laying out right. And from a, a beginner standpoint, it's, it's a great fly to fish because it has this big white post, and it's very easy for you to see while it's on the water. So it's a great, great fly to represent the spinners. But you should have those in a lot of different sizes. Now I'm going to grab a couple different fly boxes um, that I already have assembled of these mayflies. And this is kind of what you should have while you're on the stream. So let's take a look at some of those. When I'm on the river, I end up carrying, oh boy, I have probably four or five or six different fly boxes on me. Because I like to keep everything a little bit separated so that I, it's easier to organize. But let's take a look at this. This is going to be my nymph box, or a beginner's nymph box. And you can see here, we have the hair's ear nymphs that we talked about first. And the most important thing is they're in multiple sizes, different sizes. If you go into a river and you pick up a rock and you see some of these nymphs, you want to match that size. You want to match that silhouette. And then you want to match that color. But you can see I have one of each size. What you should do is you should have you know, a good selection. Two or three of each size is important because you will be losing a lot of these flies in the rocks. I also have the beaded or the bead head hair's ear nymph right here. I have our prince nymphs in the different sizes. And I have our itty bitty stuff, our pheasant tails. So with these three nymph patterns, we can represent a very, very large variation of the insects that are going to live in that natural world underwater. Now I have my dry fly box. These are going to represent those mayflies, both the, the newly hatched duns and our spinners. See here I have those atoms and I have them in a selection of sizes from larger down to our smaller. I also have that atoms parachute to represent that spinner that's available. The other thing that I have in the box is I have some different colored variations. This one's called a light Cahill. These are blue-winged olives, different species that we might see on the rivers. 
So these are just some very, very basic flies that you should most certainly have as a beginner to represent those mayflies. You definitely need all of these in your box. But a good way of kind of getting into it is some of the books and things have hatch charts on Wisconsin, the different insects that are hatching at different times of the year. Or a lot of times local stores, local shops will have good information as far as what types of bugs are hatching at what particular time. But this isn't rocket science, the art of fly fishing and the, the, the art of picking and choosing a fly. What you need to do is remember those three items, the size, the silhouette, and the color. Look at what's on the water, look at what's in your fly box, and match those two. That's what you want to keep in mind. So when you come into a store and you see all of these flies, it can get overwhelming. Start simple. Start real basic. Keep it real easy for yourself, and uh, it's going to make your time on the water an awful lot more enjoyable.